not now, but. Right. Cool. Okay, so you are starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. This is the U.S. edition, and we are very excited to get the AWS SysOps certification series kicked off this evening. And in order to do that, we've got the illustrious Byron Schaller. Um, a couple of, of housekeeping notes. Um, get in on the conversation, please. Uh, we are following you on Twitter. And so if you do a hashtag vbrownbag, we will see questions there. Or you can question us live in the, in the chat uh, panel here locally. Um, as I said previously, our guest this evening is Byron Schaller. Um, and today, the hosts are me, Chris Williams, and Rebecca Fitzhugh. Say hi, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, team. All right. <laughs> So, with that, Byron, are you still there? Yep. Hey, guys. How's it going? Awesome. Let me kick over presenter to you, sir. And you should see that. I do. All right. Let's see here. Okay. Can you guys see all that? Uh, not, yes. Yes. I can see your screen now. Great. Okay. So... Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Byron Schaller. I work at the Round Tower. I uh, have my VCDX and my AWS Certified Solutions Architect Pro and uh, Dev Associate. Been doing this uh, stuff for a little while, and let's talk about monitoring metrics. Woohoo! Yay. Right. All right, so the exam itself. Let's start there. Um, it's going to be all multiple choice, multiple response. Uh, how this works from a Amazon uh, standpoint is they usually give you uh, four choices. It's it's two or three sometimes are the are the right answers, and they're all going to be pretty similar. So uh, make sure you read closely and and just pick pick up the ones that make no sense, and then go from there. Um, tonight we're talking about the first domain, uh, so all the monitoring and metrics. So this is really about Two things: it's 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 CloudWatch and billing, and, and how you do those things. Um, it's 15% of the whole exam, so each topic is probably going to have one to two questions, depending on how valuable they think it is. All right. So again, things you need to know: CloudWatch. It's going to be mainly about metrics, some about alerts, consolidated billing, really about how to set it up, uh, billing and alerts in general. This is mo mostly about same building alerts for your account, and then cost optimization, which are probably the trickiest questions on the uh, test, and we'll go over uh, what certain keywords mean and how to think about that. All right, so CloudWatch. When it comes to monitoring in AWS, the, CloudWatch really is the, the only way to go. Um, there's also CloudWatch logs and uh, a cloud trail, but that's for syslogging and auditing. They kind of tie in to, to CloudWatch as well, but you're not going to see that much on the associate exam. Um, you, you're going to want to know what you can monitor. So it's most things, uh, except for some of the uh, newer stuff around AI and IoT and game stuff, uh, those don't have metrics, but almost everything that you're going to use for your infrastructure will. Um, things that you're going to really want to know well are EC2 instances, and that includes auto scaling groups, um, elastic load balancing, and uh, especially setting up Route 53 with ELBs and how you do health checks there, um, EBS volumes. Uh, you, you won't see much on EFS or S3 uh, on the monitoring side of things, but you will see quite a bit about on EBS. Um, CD and storage gateways, not so much. RDS, there, you are going to get a, a few questions. Uh, elastic cache is going to come up. Um, EMR and Redshift, not so much. Um, and then other stuff you can look at, you know, SNS, SQS, um, and other you know, services in the, the infrastructure realm. Um, again, I, I do want to call it CloudWatch Logs just because it is a really nice service um, to do syslog aggregation, and there's some neat things you can do there. However, you're not going to see a lot of it on the SysOps associate test. All right, so... Things you're going to need to know to start off with. With EC2, your default free tier, you're going to get five minute intervals of monitoring. Now you can go for detail monitoring and pay for it, and you can get down to one minute. One minute is the minimum granularity that you can go down to. Uh, you will probably see that on the test somewhere. Um, so when you do de detail monitoring, you can do custom metrics. 
Uh, there's a couple ways to do this. You can either set them up in the console itself, um, or the easier way to do it is to use scripts and uh, use the API. So you can do stuff like uh, memory and other things that are not native in uh, CloudWatch itself uh, through the scripting inside your instances. Now to do that, you're going to have to give your instances access to uh, CloudWatch itself, and you do that by assigning a CloudWatch role to your EC2 instance that you create through uh, IAM and give that role full permission to CloudWatch. If you give it read-only, you're not going to be able to write any metrics, so it's not going to work. By default, you get two weeks of metrics stored, even after you destroy an instance. You can get older metrics, but not through the console. You have to use the Git Metric Statistics API. Um, I would keep that in mind as well. All right, so by default, you're going to get CPU, you know, network in and out, disk IOPS and read and write bytes and status checks for your EC2 instances. You're not going to get memory. Uh, there's a really good reason for this that's not easy to explain, uh, but you can get memory stats from inside EC2 by scripting it and then writing that out to CloudWatch. However, it's not going to be under EC2. They'll be under Linux or Windows system metrics depending on uh, what your system is. Also, there's no space usage. That's because EC2 has no concept of space that you're using on your disk. Uh, that's all monitored by uh, EBS or whatever else is on your back and for storage. All right, status checks. There are two kinds of status checks, and you're going to need to know how to troubleshoot them and what they mean. So your system status check is the physical host. So that's the Amazon bare metal hardware that your EC2 is running on. If that has a problem, uh, it's either because the network is down, it's lost power, uh, there's something wrong with the host itself. Um, and if it's failing, really the best thing to do is to stop and start your instance and that's going to basically trigger the placement engine and it's going to end up on a, a healthy host. The second is your instant status checks. Or, so that's your actual EC2 VM itself. Um, that usually means something is wrong with how you set the VM up. Either you used an OS that's not compatible, um, it's corrupt, you don't have enough memory for your OS to boot, or there's something that's just inherently wrong with the VM. Uh, you can try to reboot it. If it fails again, you're going to have to modify the image itself because something with the OS is so wrong it's going to cause it to not boot. Um, when you log into your Amazon console, you see your status checks under your EC2 dashboard. It should say two of two passed, um, and these are the two that it is uh, talking about there. All right, CloudWatch and EBS. Most of this is about you know IOPS and, and you know, byte throughput, total read time. The thing that you're going to have to really keep an eye out for is volume queue length. Uh, so if you're familiar with the vSphere world and your queue depth and all that stuff, same concepts apply here. Uh, pretty much any uh, I.O. that is being you know, cached in, into the queue because it can't be serviced fast enough is going to cause this queue to go up, and that's going to cause some pretty terrible performance. Um, you will most likely on the test in something of, you know, your, your EC2 instance is not performing well. Uh, what, you know, um, EBS metric should you check for your storage, it's probably volume queue length. Or if they say that you have a volume queue length of two, uh, that's going to lead to your uh, degradation in performance. So definitely keep that in mind. Cool. EBS also has its own status checks. Now, this is a little more confusing than uh, EC2. The things you need to know here are, you know, okay, normal, it's fine. Warning has two different possibilities. So you have degraded where things are performing below expectations as far as Amazon is concerned. You're not really clear what that means, uh, but it's probably something like a disk is out in a, a RAID array, something that, that's, that's causing slightly degraded performance, um, or severely degraded, which means that something has gone terribly wrong on the array, although it's still available, you can still write to it and read to it, it's just very, very slow. Impaired has another two options. So stalled means that you basically can't read and write to it, but it is still online. Then you have not available, which is completely offline, 
and then insufficient data, which means it's online, but it has no idea what's going on. How, how, how you'll see this in the test is it'll ask about um, if you have a degraded uh, a, you know, setting, what volume status check is going to show up, and you're going to have to be warning, or stalled would be impaired. So make sure that you know these two in which, they, in which they're you know, associated with, because um, that is probably going to come up. All right, monitoring with RDS. So, so far all, all we've really talked about is CloudWatch, uh, but you can also monitor events per database um, under the RDS events tab. Um, this is going to come up in how to set up an event subscription, which under your um, RDS tab, under events, you can set up an email notification for failovers, um, things like that. Uh, that will come up. And know that you can look at your metrics either per database, per database class, or per database engine type um, under CloudWatch. When it comes to metrics for, for, for CloudWatch, you don't really need to know all of these for the test. Um, they are helpful to just know in general, but the, the ones that you should really care about are database connections, disk queue depth, free storage space, replica, lo or replica lag, you know, read IOPS, write IOPS, read latency, and write latency. So how you'll see this is when they talk about applications that are talking back to your database and there is some kind of performance issue, uh, you should check your connections to make sure that your connections are being closed. If your connections are being left open by the application, that's going to lead to a degradation in performance. Uh, disk queue depth is almost the exact same thing as EBS uh, queues. Um, again, if it's getting I.O. that it cannot immediately service, it's going to go into queue, and that's going to cause more performance issues. Look for that. Free storage space. When you're worried about running out of the underlying EBS stores that's backing your RDS instance, you should set up an alert for free storage space when it gets to you know, 80, 90%, whatever you feel is reasonable, um, to make sure that you're not going to you know, hit that limit, run out, and then be stuck. Um, replica lag, what that means is when you have read replicas, the replica lag is the amount of time it takes your master database to copy over that data to your replica, to your read replica. So if you have a situation where users are accessing the database or the, the application and they're getting inconsistent or old data, it's probably a replica lag issue, and you would check this metric to see how many seconds that lag is and figure out why that's happening. Um, read I.O., write I.O., uh, and read latency and write latency is basically, um, if you're running into those issues, you need to scale up or scale out your database. Elastic Load Balancer. So CloudWatch and ELB go hand in hand, especially if you're doing auto scaling. Um, they really have to. So one thing that's really interesting is if there's no traffic on your Elastic Load Balancer, there will be no metrics logged to CloudWatch. So if you see some you know, long gaps or whatever in CloudWatch, it's not that it's unavailable, it's just that there's no traffic, so it's not logging anything. Um, things to know here, you know, healthy or host count, unhealthy host count, Pretty straightforward. Um, request count, how many are, requests are coming into the ELB. Uh, latency, so latency is the amount of time it takes the ELB to talk to the EC2 instance backing it and for the EC2 instance to respond back to the ELB. Um, so it's round trip from the ELB's perspective. And you have a whole bunch of status codes here. So the thing to know on the HTTP code ELB, you know, 4 and 5XX, those are 400 and 500 is being generated by the ELB itself. So 400 is um, a client-side error, 500, 500 is a server-side error. You're probably not going to see these. If you do, there's something pretty inherently wrong with your, your configuration. Then your back-end error, you know, 200s, 300s, 400s, and 500s. 200s are, you know, good, to, like you have your HTTP 200 okay. Those are, you know, Good responses, threes, fours, and fives are bad um, for different reasons. Uh, that's going to see if uh, you have some problems on, on your back-end EC2 instance, that's going to come up there. 
Um, same with backing connection errors. If it can't connect for whatever reason, you've either your sockets aren't being released or you need to scale out, things like that. The things that are going to come up on the test, though, are the last two, surge queue length and spillover count. So surge queue length is when the ELB is trying to hand off a request to the to a backend EC2 instance, and it can't, for whatever reason, there's no uh, uh, open connection for, for it to go to, it's going to go into the surge queue. This is really bad. Um, it's going to stay in the surge queue until the, the connection can, can be serviced. Again, if you're having a surge queue length of two, three, more, um, you, you, you need to add more instances to your uh, auto-scaling group, and that'll fix that. What's even worse is when that queue fills up, you get what's called spillover count. And spillover count basically means that the queue is full, there's nowhere for that uh, request to go, so it just gets dropped. Um, so the end user never gets notified of that drop, so from a user experience, it's really bad. Um, but if that's happening, uh, your application is going to have some serious issues. Uh, those two will most likely come up on the test in some way, shape, or form. Elasticache. So the thing to remember about Elasticache is you have two types of backends. So you have Memcached and you have Redis. And because of you know, how they are structured and you know, how they both work, they have different options. Uh, metrics mean different things, and you should do different actions on re in response. Uh, this is really important for the test. You're only going to see a couple questions about Elasticache, most likely, but you're going to need to know how Memcached and Redis are different, and what that means from a, a, a metric standpoint. So there's four main things to care about here. Uh, first is CPU utilization. So the weird thing here is Memcached is multi-threaded and Redis is not. What that means is that a you know, CPU utilization means what it says for memcache, but not for Redis. So if your CPU is running at 90% utilization for memcache, that's totally fine. Um, you may want to add more, or if it's not exceeding that, just leave it as it is, and it's going to run OK. On Redis, since it's not multi-threaded, you have to divide your overall CPU utilization by your number of cores. So if you're at 90 or 9% utilization is what you want, uh, you need four cores, then any CPU utilization over like 22.5% is bad. Um, so keep that in mind when looking at these metrics, depending on your back end, and you can know how to address that. Swap usage, so your swap file that you're going to get for Elastic Cache is going to be the exact size of your memory. Um, over 50 megabytes is probably pretty bad for swap. Um, basically, scale up, add more memory. Um, swap usage doesn't apply for Redis at all, which is weird. Um, it uses the reserved underscore memory metric instead. So know that difference there. Um, evictions happen when your cache is full and you get a new cache hit, uh, the oldest uh, cache hit uh, stored is dropped, and that's called an eviction. So it's really up to you and your application team to decide what to do when you start getting evictions, whether that's okay, um, or whether you need to increase the size of your cache. So depending on memcache and redis, you do, do different things. On memcache D, you can scale up or scale out. You can add more, res more, res more resources to your instance or add more instances. On Redis, you cannot scale up. Um, you cannot add more resources. You can only scale out. Um, that will probably be on the test in some shape or form. Concurrent connections are another really variable thing. So you can't make a hard judgment. You have to really talk to your, you know, app devs and figure out what they think is appropriate, and what makes sense, and then settle an alarm for when that threshold is exceeded, and then act accordingly depending on what your app devs think you should do. Right. Centralized monitoring server. So this is stuff like Nagios, uh, VCOPS, uh, various other you know, uh, the normal monitoring systems that you'd run in your data center. 
you're going to see a couple questions on how these interact uh, with AWS in general. And really, it's probably going to come up in the form of connectivity, uh, security groups, and how it's connected either uh, on-prem or between VPCs. The thing to know here is it's probably going to say your central monitoring system can't uh, talk to your instances, uh, so can't monitor them for whatever reason. Um, this is going to come down to either ICMP or sp specific ports being opened up in the security groups uh, in the proper VPC. Um, that's, that's going to solve your problem. Uh, just make sure that uh, that network traffic is allowed from the client on the EC2 instance back to wherever your centralized monitor server is, whether you're on-prem or a separate VPC, and that's going to solve your problem. Um, there may be a question about this. If there is, there's only going to be probably one on the, on the test. CloudWatch alarms. So there's not a lot to know here. The first thing it really is, you know, alarms can be created for any metric, including custom metrics, and all alarms include a threshold and a triggered action. So a triggered action can be a number of things. Uh, it can be notifying a topic and sending an email. Uh, it could be you know, auto-scaling. It could be a number of things. It, re it really depends on uh, what metric you're choosing, what your, your options are going to be. So just know that, that you can do that. Um, on the DevOps protest, you need to know a lot more about this before the SysOps associates know that you can set them, know that you need a threshold, and know that you need a triggered action. Billing alarms, this is interesting. So you can only edit billing alarms in the U.S. East North Virginia region. Even if you're in Singapore or you know Ireland, doesn't matter. Uh, you have to change your region to U.S. East North Virginia to edit your billing alarms. Um, billing alarms have two different uh, things to do. You basically set a dollar amount that you want to be notified at and an email to send that notification to. Uh, the free tier gives you 10 alarms at this and 1,000 emails per month. Chances of you seeing that are pretty much zero. Um, that's, that's really it as far as billing alarms go. So billing in general. The first thing you're going to need to know about is consolidated billing. Uh, if you've taken any of the um, solution architect exams, this comes up quite a bit. Uh, it comes up less in the SysOps exam, but you still need to know about it. Really, all you need to know is that you can link accounts under the billing and cost management menu. I think that's actually changed now, but that's what it's called on the test. Um, not on the test, but things that you should know is that if you're going to do consolidated billing, the best thing to do is to have an empty master payer account. So an account that has uh, basically no resources and is just used for the logistical reasons of being a consolidated billing account. This is for a number of really good security reasons and other stuff, um, but that's how it should be set up. So why you do this is you can leverage your discounts across all accounts under consolidated billing. You can also leverage your RIs across all accounts under consolidated billing. So if you have a reserved instance in one account that for some reason you're not using, you can allocate that same RI to a different account under the same consolidated billing master and use it as you will. Um, this makes a lot of sense for managed service providers. There's a lot of money to be saved by doing this. Um, or if you have different BUs under an enterprise organization that all want to use AWS but have their own control, there's a lot of money to be saved with consolidated billing. Um, that's pretty easy to set up. So here's where things get really confusing. Um, so EC2 cost optimization. So there are three different kinds of EC2 instances. You have on-demand, reserved, and spot price. On-demand basically means you're going to pay whatever the going rate is for an, an on-demand instance, and AWS is going to try really, really, really hard to make sure that when you need it, it is there. It is not guaranteed, um, although I've never tried to launch an on-demand instance and been denied. I've heard of folks who have been, uh, but know that you are not guaranteed the instance when you go to launch it if it's an on-demand instance. 
a reserved instance is guaranteed to be able to be launched when you want to use it. With reserved instance, you also get a lower price than on-demand instance, but you sign up for a contract uh, for, I think it's one or three years, and you pay for that entire duration of that contract, used or unused. Um, on demands only when it's powered on. So thinking of spot price, where you basically bid for instances. So you set your spot price, and whenever the cost of the instance goes above what you're willing to pay for your spot price, your instance is in, not instantly, but pretty quickly terminated, just out from under you with no warning, uh, and goes away. So this is really good for um, large batch processing that can be done at off hours, uh, like around uh, HPC or big data stuff for research, uh, things where you have all the outputs um, and inputs, you know, put in F into S3, so they're not all the instance itself, and you can leverage that power for a cheaper cost, uh, basically whenever, and you don't really care when it gets done as long as it gets done eventually. So there's also two kinds of utilization. So you have heavy and medium. And basically that says, you know, am I going to use a, you know, C3 extra large or a C3 medium? Um, figuring out what your usage pattern is going to be. So this is going to come up in the test in the form of they will give you a scenario. Uh, say, you know, you have a web application, an auto scaling group, uh, it needs a couple instances to run all the time. Uh, you know, during the day it may use six, and night maybe you know four, and then every once in a while you're going to peak up to you know ten to fifteen on a couple of peak days. So how should you deploy that? You know, and it's going to give you a you know, whole list of options that includes some kind of reserved instances, some kind of on-demand instances, and maybe some kind of spot instances. Um, and there'll probably be some kind of heavy and medium utilization language in there as well. The key here is that you're going to want to choose heavy and reserved for the bare minimum it takes to keep your system running at all times. After that, you're going to want to pick medium and on-demand for your you know, kind of daily spiky stuff. Um, and then you're going to want to pick, or maybe heavy and on-demand, it depends. Um, and then medium and on demand, or on demand for your seasonal spiky load stuff. You're almost never going to select spot in this instance. In fact, it's pretty rare you're, you're going to select spot at all. Um, the only time in that kind of question when you would select spot instance is if there is no time frame where you care that the work is done, as long as the work is done eventually, and the inputs and the outputs to the data is stored elsewhere from the instance and there's no customer-facing application that is reliant on that instance. Because if you have a customer-facing application that's reliant on a spot instance running, and then your spot price is exceeded, and all of a sudden that instance no longer exists, that impacts you know, a negative user experience, and that's, that's bad. You, you don't want to do that. Um, so just keep in mind that spot's usually not the right answer unless you got those weird batch load kind of things. Um, and always pick reserved for the minimum you need to run your entire. Um, what I got for slides and what you have to know for the test itself, um, I'll go over uh, in the console here real quick and show you guys a couple things. Uh, before we do that, uh, Chris, Rebecca, any questions, comments so far? Uh, there have there's been uh, no questions in the feed, Mr. Beck. Or was there anything in, in Twitter? Only I a uh, bunch in Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, well, I mean, we have the the lovely one from Tom Green, wanting to know <laughs> <laughs> what is the exchange rate between app devs and DevOps. <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. I, I responded to that already. I said three bushels. Three bushels. Yeah. And then uh, Rob Nelson asked if you're going to let us know how to detect S3 outages before Amazon does. Oh, see, if I did, I'm, I'm in just the wrong line of work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I accidentally outed you as a soothsayer, so my bad. Oh, dude, yeah. that's bad, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> he has the beard for it, so totally. <laughs> 
It is the Ides of March. Um, what else? I think that was it for questions. Okay. Uh, some statements from Rob Nelson about setting up alerts. Yep. Um, say, saying, you know, setting up two alerts, one for $2 and then one for $5 so that you can track your patterns and everything. But, um, yeah, no, I, I think we are good to go. Oh, I, I just saw scales. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't mind those. <laughs> I recognize those immediately. Uh, trying to get that. Oh, that's not working. Okay, I'm going to make a new one. All right, bear with me one second here, and I'll get uh, my console. There we go. Okay. Can you guys see that? Da -da -da -da. Yep, the new console. Yep, which I like. I think it's actually not bad. I, I, I like it now that I've gotten used to it. Yeah. It took me a bit. All right. So a few things I wanted to point out. Um, so we we're talking about status checks. The two of two, it's this column right here, when you select a node under your status checks tab down here, uh, yep, system status check, and it's the status check. Uh, so again, remember this is your underlying hardware, and this is the VM itself. Uh, pretty straightforward. And then something's actually changed under CloudWatch, but it's not changed on the test yet. Uh, I don't know when they're going to do that, but that is metrics down here. So how you view and graph your metrics is, I think, slightly better now. It's uh, a lot more aligned with what some of the SAS guys are doing. Um, so I'll take your process metrics, select your metric, and boom, you get your cool little graph. Um, and then you can select a bunch, and it does it all for you. It's actually it's actually pretty well 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 done. Um, the thing to know here is if you do not tag your instances with names, uh, it gets to be kind of a pain to find out what you are looking for. Uh, so make sure you use good tagging. Um, billing is here for alarms, and also on the billing side. Uh, I don't have access to billing on this account, so I can't get to it, but uh, that's where you, where you would find it. Um, events, this is when, where you go to create a rule, pick your event source, your pattern match, and you can add your add your targets and set all that up all under here. Uh, all, all this stuff is pretty intuitive and straightforward. Um, there is a couple things you should read uh, probably before going into the test. Oh, one thing I want to show you here. Uh, under I am all right so when you want to create a role for your EC2 instance to use all right so under I am under roles create new role let's call it right and EC2. All right. If you use filter under CloudWatch here, CloudWatch full access is the policy that you want to assign. If you want to write internal me metrics for EC2 instance uh, out to CloudWatch, you have to have this policy assigned to a role. You create the role. Then under EC2, remember that you can only assign roles when you launch a new instance. Uh, P2. Under here, we're going to click, click our CloudWatch write role under I am roles when you make your instance. Once your instance is, is launched, you can't do this, so make sure that you create that role and assign it before you launch your instance. I don't know if that's on the test or not, but uh, it is definitely worth knowing. So, uh, things you should read if you are so inclined before you take the test. Uh, there is the AWS um, Linux uh, user guide, I think it's called. It's like in our pages, it's something crazy. Um, has a ton of detail about monitoring and utilization and things like that. Um, 
it's way overkill for this test, but if you read that, you will definitely be prepared. Um, I would highly suggest reading it before you take the Solutions Architect uh, Pro or DevOps Pro test, um, but it's a really, really good place to start. That that's on that's in the AWS uh, website. The documentation yeah, for Linux. Yeah, it's a white paper. Here, let me find the find, find what it actually is here. Uh, I should have that prepared. Feel free to talk about yourselves. <laughs> oh no, it's it's okay. We're we're, um, we're we're furiously answering questions and and uh, re responding to snarky com comments on Twitter. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> I expect a lot from my friends. <laughs> Everybody showed up to encourage you. Good, good for them. All right. Um, So, um, uh, a quick question here: in in other than the uh, the blueprints, the exam blueprint, are there any other resources that a budding AWS learner might want to hit up? Um, I guess I can show for their product, even though I don't work for them or get any money for it. Um, a Cloud Guru is still, I think, one of the best sites out there. Oh. Um, their 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 content's fantastic. Their forums are great. Um, I I really couldn't recommend the, those guys enough. Um, other than that, just use AWS. <laughs> Get a free account. Play around with it. That's going to be the best way to figure all this stuff out. Um, although the amount of services out there are pretty daunting now. But uh, uh, just yeah. make some instances. You know, if, you, if you have a blog, move your blog to, to, to AWS. You know, throw it behind a auto scaling group with an ALB, and you know, throw your WordPress database onto RDS, and you know, do stuff like that, and you'll pick the stuff up pretty fast. Um, other resources out there? Let's see here. Um, for for those that don't know that are listening, uh, you can sign up for a one year free AWS account. Um, for, uh, it's called the free tier. It's everything's not free, but but there are but a lot of the stuff the T two micros are free. There's 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 some some good flexibility, and you can play with a lot of stuff without without spending a cent. You can do a ton. I mean, there's a bunch of sites out there that actually run their full sites on on the free tier. Um, it's really quite amazing what, what they will let you do. Hmm. I need to flip mine over to it. I highly recommend it, um, especially if you use Lambda. There's some really cool stuff you can do. Uh, <laughs> Tom Green. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Okay, best practices for Amazon EC2. That's what you should read. Uh, is there a chat I can post this in here? Here we go. Nice. And uh, go, go ahead and throw it up in the uh, in in the screen for the recording as well. Oh, right. Yeah, there's that. There we go. Um, awesome. Yeah. So all the stuff here, all the links it goes through. If you go for specifically for this stuff, um, monitoring. So these every service that e, that AWS has has these uh, specific um, you know breakouts. Under, under their docs, and they go through in depth, you know, everything, um, with links out to all kinds of other stuff. Um, their docs are really good, and they're very thorough. And most of the stuff that you're going to find, 
especially on the associate level tests, are really in the documentation if you just, just read that. It's not the most exciting stuff to read, but it's definitely going to get you what you need to know. Cool. Excellent. All right, so um, Mr. Rebecca, are there, are there any other questions in, in uh, Twitter? Uh, Ken asked, oh. what happens when your one-year free tier of AWS ends? Uh, I would pay the $7 to keep going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not good enough. No, seriously. Um, no, it's – if you are not running, like, you know, a full commercial business, it's – you can get by for, for pretty cheap. Um, it may not be free, but it's it's not terribly expensive. Um, the best thing to do if you're paying for it is turn your stuff off at night, or better yet, set up a, uh, a simple workflow to do it for you. Um, if you're not actively using your lab and that's what it's up there for, you know, power it down. Um, if you are running your like you know personal blog on there, just set your auto scaling to you know as bare bones as possible, and really check out and. Monitor and make sure that you're making the best use of, of your cost possible. Um, you're you're going to see pretty quickly that you can run, you know, a lot on, uh, especially from a personal blog site, um, on very very little resources. And so just be mindful of that, and uh, you can do it for for not very much. Alternatively, the sneaky answer is. You can, if you have multiple credit cards, each one is tied to a credit card. Um, so you, you could theoretically, you know, if you've got two credit cards, go over two years. But I, I didn't advocate that at all, ever. Or multiple email addresses. No one's ever done that before. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Jail time for both of you. No, they're going to get us. No. <laughs> um, or there's, you know, always you know, sign up for your uh, 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 Azure account somehow. Once someone figures that out, we'll let me know. <laughs> no. Um, oh, uh, Graham Mitchell. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, Graham Mitchell asked, "Can you run a blog on Lambda?" Yes. Y yes, you can. Um, in fact, I think most of a Cloud Guru site runs on Lambda. Mm. Um, and so there's some tutorials out there on how to do it, but uh, you can run most of it through Lambda. Yes. And if you do that, the Lambda costs are actually even cheaper than the EC2 and RDS costs. Um, and you can run it for like almost, I think, it's like 70 cents a month or something. It's something super crazy cheap. Wow. Yeah, that's all you know, super tricky stuff, but uh, totally useful. I wonder if they have a WordPress port into the, so that you could just uh, dump everything over into it. It'd probably be easier to run Hugo, but probably, yeah. Oh, I'll have to ask you about that offline then. Cool. <laughs> sure. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, um, other than that, no questions on on the feed internally. Uh, wait, am I am I wrong? Oh, <laughs> Graham. <laughs> uh, no, no. Okay. So so I'm I'm clean for questions internally. Miss Fitzhugh. Uh, nothing on Twitter. Cool. Awesome. So uh, was was that it, Mr. Schaller? Yeah, I mean it's a, it's uh, this stuff's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, it, once you get through uh, most of these deep round back stuff in this series, you guys should be good to go for the exam. Um, I do highly recommend taking the practice exam. It's like fifteen twenty bucks or something. Uh, mm -hmm. The questions are almost identical to what is on the test. I found in almost every case, if not they're like, they changed the name of the company or something. Um, but it's very reflexive of what you're going to see when you take the actual test. And if you're doing well there, then you're ready to go. Excellent. Fantastic advice. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Okay. So so um, we're, we're out of questions on the inside, and we're done with questions within Twitter. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. And we're good. Thank you, Mr. Schaller. That was yeah. fantastic. Yay. <laughs>